So everyone, thanks for taking time in your day to join our site visit with our 2021 $35,000 nurturing grant finalist, The Social Studio. I'm Kate Eddy, and I'm co-deputy chair of the Melbourne Women's Fund Grants Committee. Before we begin, I invite you to join me in the spirit of a reconciliation for an acknowledgement of country. Melbourne Women's Fund sincerely acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as first Australians and traditional custodians of country. We recognise and value their continuous connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thank you. Before we meet the social studio, there's just a couple of housekeeping items to help you get the most out of your visit today. Attendees will be muted throughout. However, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar screen to submit a question at any time. They will be answered toward the end of the visit. You can use the chat function as well at any time to make general comments or to chat with other attendees. This meeting will be recorded so you can share it with other Melbourne Women's Fund members and other people who couldn't be here today. We're so fortunate to have this opportunity for this in-depth experience with our finalists. I'm pleased to provide a brief overview of the Social Studios application. The project that they're seeking support for is called Designing Our Futures Women's Empowerment Scholarships and it falls within the Melbourne Women's Fund membership's 2021 focus areas of employment and economic empowerment. This project aims to overcome barriers to economic and social participation faced by refugee and migrant women by enhancing their educational and employment opportunities. The social studio team who you're going to meet today are Davey Cook, the CEO, Kate Coleman, who's behind the camera, she's a philanthropy executive, Fiona Chisnell, the education program coordinator, and Tega Siogiman, the student pathways coordinator. I'm now pleased to hand over to the social studio team for our tour. Take it away, Dewey. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Dewey Cook. I'm the CEO of the social studio and I'm standing in the doorway right now of our workshop and school. Um, we're located at the Collingwood Yards, which is, if you haven't had a chance to visit yet, is a um, arts precinct dedicated to um, providing affordable and reliable space to artists and arts organisations. Um, we are very lucky to be here and we're very kind of proximate to a lot of like-minded artists and arts organisations that help facilitate the work that we do here. Um, before I go on, uh, I will put my mask on um, once I'm inside. So if you've got any troubles hearing me, uh, perhaps raise a hand and let me know or let um, Kate on the other side of the camera know. Um, I'll just give you a little rundown right now before we enter about the social studio so that you have a bit of context for what you'll be seeing. Um, the social studio was started in 2009. We started on a very small shop front on Smith Street and um, the original intention was a place for creativity and connection for people from refugee and new migrant backgrounds um, using the creative arts, designs, textiles um, to uh, forge a new kind of narrative around what it meant to be a um, person from that background um, or from an asylum seeking background in Melbourne. Um, this is a different kind of period of Australia's history, obviously. Um, and, you know, really we started with using um, clothing and fabrics that were upcycled and turning them into something new. And that was a sort of training space, education space, as well as a retail space. Um, the core and the sort of heart of the social studio in that sense hasn't really changed. Um, but what we deliver now, I think, is a sort of grown up sister version of that. Um, we are a not-for-profit social enterprise, which means that we run a free school for people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. We deliver a Cert 3 in clothing production that's accredited by RMIT University and we also operate a social enterprise manufacturing studio that's Ethical Clothing Australia accredited and a socially conscious retail venture uh, which is downstairs from our studio today um, where we exclusively stop work from creatives from Black, Indigenous and culturally diverse backgrounds. Um, the space that we're about to enter has both our manufacturing studio in it and our school. We have been able to continue manufacturing 
through lockdown um, because we're a permitted industry, um, but we've only just started bringing our students back um, in very small groups to finish their assessments. They have otherwise been entirely remote for nearly three months, um, which is a very difficult thing for various reasons, not least of all because uh, we deliver a very vocational program that's very hands-on and um, doing that over Zoom, um, as you can imagine, uh, even through a mobile phone like Kate is holding right now, is, um, is very hard both for the teachers and the learners, but we're really proud to say that um, the majority of our students have stayed incredibly engaged and um, some have already finished their assessments because they were able to keep up with their workload, which is well ahead of the university's own schedule. So we're really proud of what has been able to be achieved um, and that has come through a lot of um, pivoting, hard work um, and kind of new territories for everybody. Um, so my mask is going up because um, we're going inside, but I'll show you around. Um, first, we're going to just walk in and I'll show you where our office sits. Um, so we've got our community engagement worker, Sherry Rose, is over here. Sherry Rose is saying hi. Um, over behind the silver computer is our production manager, Tara. Um, next to her is Bonnie, who runs our creative projects and retail. Um, and then I'll take you over to what today is manufacturing, and that is just one person. That's Amy, our dressmaker today. Um, Amy's over by the iron. <laughs> um, she's just finishing off a job order. Um, we manufacture primarily for third parties. We do a little bit of our own in-house manufacturing for our house label. Um, and for anything that we do in-house and for our school, we rely on donated or um, dead stock materials that we source from um, big brands or retailers. So um, underneath the table here, you can see mostly um, donated fabrics that we will use in some form for either our own creative projects or in-house label. And then we've got client-based work as well. Um, and there's a lot of that right now. Our manufacturing studio, although there's just one person today, we have got people working remotely as well. Um, and we have more staff coming on on a casual basis just because we're absolutely um, slammed with orders and there's more work than we know what to do with right now, um, which is a really exciting moment for us. I'm going to take you around now to the school. And as we go through, you'll see some things on the mannequins. Um, there's a bit of uh, patchwork um, garments that Amy has worked on over the, um, the year, just sort of exploring her creativity, um, which is, again, all using dead stock fabrics and recycled fabrics. Um, you'll see remnants of creative projects and offcuts from manufacturing, which we either repurpose um, into projects of our own or we send to um, either turn into new fibres or downcycle into different products. Um, we're going into the school now where you're lucky that this, uh, you'll be able to see some of the beautiful work of some of our students as well. This is um, Samia over here. This is her uh, beautiful abaya. Samia doesn't want to be on <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> She doesn't like to, uh, to uh, see, her, see her face that much, but she's got this beautiful abaya that she made for Eid this year. I think she does maybe that one for that. Um, and then coming down, we've got a beautiful skirt from Porta there. Um, and one of Hoda's uh, garments from our gala a couple of years ago, Hoda's just over on the other table. Um, we've got a piece from another one of our students, John, um, and this is all hand cut. It's not laser cut, it's hand cut. She sat with scissors and she hand cut out um, the Zodiac, which is pretty special. And then um, this is where our teachers and support staff sit. There's Tika there, she's our student pathways coordinator. <laughs> uh, hi, say hi, everybody. <laughs> This is uh, Fiona over here in the black dress, um, and this is the school side. So the school's cutting table, all the fabrics that they use, um, as well as all the different machinery that we've acquired over the years, um, beg, borrowed, and not stolen. But, um, uh, definitely have yeah been creative with what we've had to do with machines over the years to keep them going, um, and then. 
all in here is, yeah, is the kind of stuff of life for the school. It's all the files and the things that we need to maintain to, um, to keep the classes going. So I was going to, um, while I was here, throw to Fiona, but I can see she's with a couple of students now just finalizing her. Oh, you're all right? Okay, <laughs> Fiona's here. Um, and she's our education program coordinator. Um, she came on board this year and has really kind of revolutionized the school and what it's done. So um, I just would just get Fiona maybe to give us a little brief rundown of the kind of work that you're doing and um, and how it's delivered, I guess. and, and all the challenges that you've encountered. Well, this year has been challenging because a lot of it's been delivered online. And um, our students have got different um, different enthusiasm for online learning, you know, depending on their access to technology and their literacy with technology as well. But we have got through it quite well. <laughs> um, a lot of WhatsApp and a lot of um, YouTube videos and a lot of um, Zoom sessions. So at the moment, we're just bringing everyone back in in small groups to complete their assessments um, and it's pretty much just an individual learning program for each student um, all of them have got different stages they're at and um, abilities and we just try and find that point for them and, and develop develop them from where they got where they're at yeah, yeah. I, I think what's interesting is that um, in an in an ordinary period or moment in history you know, the school is really it's already a kind of diverse place right like it's already got students at different semesters with different um, levels of ability before they get here and the teachers have to adapt to that but now they're actually having to do it in very specific ways not just like wait your turn and you know everyone can kind of get a go they're scheduling in time to kind of deliver one-on-one -on -one learning which is obviously much more time intensive um, and it's probably not something that I think um, the way that they've had to do it has been something that we, we would have expected or anticipated um, 18 months ago or two years ago, you know, when all of this began. So I think that um, how quickly they've been able to adapt has been really extraordinary. And um, we're very lucky that Fiona is also an extremely visual and organised person. Um, <laughs> so her spreadsheets have saved, I think, <laughs> us. Um, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and this means that, you know, we know how the students are progressing and where they're at in their studies. Um, Thanks, Fiona. I, like, I know you're busy. Um, yeah, so students are just finishing assessments. Um, hope, we're hoping and kind of barreling towards um, mid-December is the end date. But like I said, some of them have finished already and then we've got a new wave that just started coming back in the last week. Um, so it's kind of a push for them to get going. Um, teams, I'm going to throw over to Tiga now, who's our Student Pathways Coordinator, who I always like to say is one of the most important people in the organisation because he is really the first point of contact for so many students um, in terms of showing interest in the social studio and in enrolling in the social studio. But because of the challenges of the last year and a half, um, I think he's really been kind of instrumental in us retaining students because of the outreach that he's done and the relationships that he's built and cultivated over that time. Um, so I might just let Teague's in his own words explain the job he does and some of the things that he's done recently. Um, I guess with, COVID, um, a lot of the challenges that the students have kind of changed and shifted a little bit, uh, which also means that my role kind of shifted a little bit when it comes to sort of supporting the students. So um, prior to COVID-19, I was sort of more focused on finding um, employment and pathway educations. Um, obviously with COVID, many of our students are isolated. Um, we've got all of our students are female identifying and some of them are parents. So, um, you know, the focus was more about how do we try to get them engaged um, with the study and still feel motivated while also trying to help them overcome a lot of their social sorts of sort of psychosocial challenges. So, you know, for some, some examples, we um, try to help organize um, food for some students who didn't have access to food. Um, we tried to get them internet access for students that didn't have access to internet. So those are some of the things that we kind of did um, just to help the students sort of stay engaged with their study. <laughs> Thank you, Tia. Thank you, Tia. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's sort of safe to say that 
the social studio is not just kind of one idea. Um, it has many parts, but it unites around this concept of, um, you know, creativity, opportunity and community. And we try to um, provide that in all the work that we do. So the school is very much the heart and soul of, of that, the work of the manufacturing um, studio and the work of the retail um, operations helps support the kind of broader goals of the school and the other education programs that we deliver. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we've, we've been going since 2009. So um, we feel like we're onto a good thing. Um, and uh, it really feels like in some ways we're on the kind of having moved to the Collingwood Yards, it feels like we've we've crushed a threshold in terms of what the organisation can do and where our goals are um, and what we want to do for the future. So it's a really exciting moment for us in spite of, you know, the challenges and difficulty of, um, of 2020 and 2021. Um, but we're still really hopeful and, um, you know, we know that we've got the kind of the model that, that works um, for the kind of work we want to do. So I think we'll... Um, this might hopefully not be too um, discombobulating for the audience, but we'll walk back out of the workshop and take you to the retail space where we've got a bit more um, privacy and it's a bit quieter. Um, I'm just gonna grab my key. Yeah, of course. You get the benefit of um, and now having a tour of Collingwood Yards, <laughs> um, which is uh, very special. We're about to walk past West Face Gallery, which is one of Melbourne's leading independent galleries. <laughs> and they'll have a new exhibition opening in about a week and a half, um, which is a collaboration with one of the other tenants here, Agency Project. Um, who we also collaborate with, so we're kind of lucky that we have this. If you want to go past, you can go past. Yes, no worries. <laughs> um, so we also collaborate with a bunch of different um, arts organisations here, and um, that's one of the real kind of beauties of being here is having, um, like I said, proximity to other like-minded organisations, as well as opening up our students for um, those opportunities. So, um, you know, we are... We've had students and staff participate in exhibitions over at Bus Projects, which is just across the way. Um, we have obviously students participating in community art projects that we run out of here as well. Um, and yeah, we just kind of have a host of other things that we've had on the back burner that we haven't had a chance to deliver yet, um, which we will be delivering hopefully in the next couple of months. All right, is that store? Okay. <laughs> so I think maybe my take. Oh take, yeah. Take Coleman to join me for this Can part. Change um, the camera around. We'll just come over here. Yeah. Obviously, we've not. Um, We've not done much streaming back before, but um, hopefully you guys can hear us and see us okay. Um, I guess I could talk a little bit about retail if you're interested. Um, tell me if you'd like to um, me to stop. But, um, you know, we're very lucky uh, in our retail space here. Um, we had the, um, the kind of great benefit of having some pro bono architecture design help um, from Dave Goss at Studio Goss. And um, he's designed us this gorgeous space. And we tried to make this a space that is um, not just transactional, but um, flexible and community driven. So um, a lot of our fixtures, like our bench tops, um, can be dismantled and um, turned into a catwalk, which, is, which has happened. That happened in March, um, where we hosted a couple of our staff members who are launching their own labels. Um, you know, we've turned it into a gallery space. Right now, um, there's a beautiful community um, patchwork flag that we developed for a South Sudanese artist um, that our staff, students and community members um, all 
participated in or added to and um, that's hanging in our window uh, on display for people to see. So we're, we are like, we're not a conventional, I think in many ways, um, commercial enterprise. We try to um, deliver impact at the same time as delivering kind of product or service. Um, but yeah, that's probably all I was going to say. Um, I think we'll hand it back to you guys and i um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Davey and Kate. Um, yes, um, we can now turn to questions. A few have come through, so I'm just going to read those out and uh, you can answer them. Um, so one of the questions is um, the skill level of participants when they start. Um, when people come to the social studio, are they beginners or do they have some sewing skills? Um, it's a pretty big variety. So um, there are a couple of, the only requirements from um, the CERT program from RMIT's point of view is that they have a English language level of two, which is rated through a um, what's called a uh, BKS, BKSB test, um, but there's no prerequisites in terms of um, sewing skills or industry skills. And so we really do find that there's this um, broad range of ability um, where some people have never used a sewing machine before and have, um, you know, their first, one of the first tasks on their first day is to sew along the lines on a piece of paper to show that they can show so straight. And then you've got others who have been sewing maybe their whole lives or, you know, or their whole children's lives um, who uh, it's a challenge in a different way because then you're kind of um, teaching them new habits, right? Um, because there's a difference between being a home sewer and being an industry level um you know, garment maker. Um, so yeah, we definitely um, we definitely don't have, I think, a common um, student in that sense. Um, but the but the way the course is structured um, assumes very little knowledge at the beginning. Um, you know, like I said, where they're sewing straight lines on paper. To by the end of it, um, they're doing advanced pattern making. And being able to dismantle and recreate, you know, garments in a in a refined and, and um, developed way. Right. Yeah, that's that's really impressive. Um, how many students do you work with every year, roughly? Um, I mean, again, it it's sort of hard to say what's normal, <laughs> um, but we've got engaged this year after this last lockdown we've got about 14 um and you know we've had up to and beyond 20 um we yeah we, we it's really hard to say right now what next year will look like um because we know of at least four students who have not been able to continue through this last lockdown for various reasons related to what fiona was talking about some just didn't have you know, enough access to internet or weren't able to juggle it with um, their caring responsibilities as well as just the difficulties of um, enduring another lockdown in Melbourne. Um, but we know that at least four of the those who disengage uh, want to come back. So we know we're hopeful we'll be, yeah, we'll be around 18 by next year. Okay. Um, and do they have to contribute anything to the cost of the training? No, the whole purpose of what we do is to remove those barriers. So, you know, cost in education can be really significant, even if they do um, can access free TAFE. So what we, the, the arrangement we have with RMIT is that they don't, they waive the fees for students, but we also provide all of their equipment. So um, obviously access to sewing machines, but um, set squares for pattern making, you know, long meter, long rulers, pattern making paper, card, um, all the fabric, all the thread, any sorts of trims, everything like that, that just makes it as easy as possible to be as creative as possible is what we provide. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question came through about the range of products. I know you mentioned it in passing, but could you um, tell us a bit more about the range of products that are created? Yep, that we make ourselves. Uh, yeah. Yeah, or do you mean what the students create? Or maybe maybe you could elaborate on both and what the difference is. Yeah, sure. So the students um, are pretty much, I'm just trying to think over the um, cu curriculum, are uh, pretty much entirely 
looking at garments and accessories. So, um, you know, they start off um, uh, making their first piece of assessment is a tote bag. Their second piece of assessment is a bucket hat. And then they move on from there to things like um, uh, classic shirts. You know, they'll do a t-shirt, they'll do um, four panelled skirts, um, things that just require more and more complexity as they go on. Um, they don't really do anything like homewares or beyond the hat and the bag. There's not many more accessories that they make. From um, what we produce in our studio for manufacturing, um, we do mostly women's wear. Uh, we do some homewares. We've just had a big order of like children's bean bags and play mats. Um, we'll be doing. We're about to do two thousand coasters and a thousand tablecloths. So um, there are some things like that. But but I think I it would be fair to say our bread and butter is women's wear. A bit of men's wear. Um, we are getting a lot of interest in stretch activewear things, lingerie as well as activewear, but that requires not just a certain skill set, but also certain levels of equipment that we don't have. So we have to say no to a lot of those jobs. Um, and we're kind of trying to move as much as a little bit more into merchandise. So again, things like tote bags and t-shirts because they are becoming just so common and popular. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. That's that's helpful to know. Um, another question has come through. Um, could you tell us a little more about the scholarship aspect and are there target participants for the scholarships? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, so when we talk about our scholarships it's really it's um, it includes a certificate three program that um, Dewey and Fiona were talking about but um, in addition to that so that has its benefits as well so we've sort of a, um, amended the certificate three that RMIT usually provide and we've kind of extended it and um, made some changes to it to make it as accessible as possible. As Davey said, we're always trying to remove barriers that people might have to traditional education. Um, but in addition to offering that program, we, um, Tiga, who you met, um, delivers the Student Pathways program, which we're um, really proud of. It's um, a very one-to-one -one sort of program where Tiga works individually with each of our um, Certificate 3 participants um, to identify their goals and um, sort of puts together a bit of a learning plan in order to achieve those goals during the time that the students are with us. So it's a two-year Certificate 3 program, so it's a two-year scholarship. Um, and so TIGA will work with someone and maybe identifies that, you know, when they finish the Certificate 3 at the social studio, their dream is to continue and to become a fashion designer. So then, you know, um, Tiga will sort of look at, well, what this is what you'll need to do after the Cert 3. Um, you know, maybe somebody will need to um, improve their English. Maybe they'll need to get some work experience in the industry. Um, maybe they'll, you know, need some support around the interview process for, when looking for work. Everybody's different. Um, and that's, you know, why Dave was saying that Tiga is so <laughs> important to our organisation because he's just... Um, really that person who sits with each individual student and makes this the scholarship the two years that they have with us really their own and um, yeah just makes the experience of the students as, um, as good as possible I guess um, and also you know we obviously want people to um, enjoy their time at the social studio and really get a lot out of it but we're also really keen on you know what, what comes next for our students and just supporting them whatever that looks like in whatever field um, that looks like. Um, so yeah, I guess that's more about the, the scholarship as a whole. So it encompasses the Cert 3 and the wraparound supports, which might include English support, um, you know, women's empowerment workshops. Um, we have some people who are interested in starting their own business, so we'll hook them up with a mentor in that space. So it's really a tailored um, experience for each individual student. Yeah, and I think um, just building on what Kate said as well and the work that Tiga does, you know, in terms of the demographics of our students, um, that's shifted as well, I think, over the years. Um, but it's pretty safe to say that right now the majority of our students are um, female identifying um, from mostly Horn of Africa countries um, and predominantly Muslim. We do have you know, some other students from other backgrounds, um, both religious and cultural, um, but I would say that's the kind of overwhelming majority. And um, whereas I know like a 
few years ago, we, we had um, students who were Burmese background or students from Cambodian backgrounds, you know, that there were, there's been students from Afghani backgrounds. So there's just, there's a range. And I think it's probably reflective of um, the different kind of movements of, of populations within Melbourne um, and migrant groups within Melbourne and refugee groups within Melbourne and, and how they develop. Because we tend to get people not so much, I think, in their first years, first year of settlement, but more like um, from about three, I would say three years onwards. Um, some people have been here for a really long time, um, but who have sort of had their difficulties with, with settlement or feeling part of a community beyond their own um, cultural community. So, um, yeah, so I think that from the point of view of the, who the scholarship targets, um, we're really m much more about like opening it up to as many groups as possible um, and um, and beyond the the target of the of the youth kind of age group you know 18 to 25 or 18 to 30 like you know we're we're really open to to whomever can come right um do you ever get oversubscribed and how would you select participants if you had more than you could take on um like it, it feels like we're oversubscribed sometimes um, just because of how um, complex the the group can be um, and like we mentioned before how um, varying their abilities are um, when they first begin um, you know we we are RMIT's kind of recommended band is between 10 and 20 um, but but we've had more than that I know in the past um, I mean, I've been at the social studio for a year um, and Kate's been here for a bit longer. So um, I think we've what the view that we have is probably formed informed by fairly recent um, experiences. Um, and I would say that it's something that we've I've talked about with Fiona is at what point do we get selective? Um, because uh, on one hand, the sort of core principle of what we do is to try to um, make access to education and employment opportunities um, as available as possible to everybody um, but should we get to the point of being oversubscribed um, it would actually oh, sorry I had a battery warning there um, uh, it, should we get to the point of being oversubscribed it would actually um, really help the teachers to be able to select students who have more ability or um, uh, who are more ready to go so um, we're not at that phase yet, but I think what we will be implementing is um, over the summer for new enrollees or over the midwinter break when we get a second tranche of enrollment, kind of mandatory skills workshop where we'll do, um, you know, two to three weeks of some of those initial basic skills because it can, we've observed that it can seem quite overwhelming for some of our new students um, who have never, like I said, seen a sewing machine before to try to take that all in um, on the first day of school or the first few weeks of school, as well as maybe juggling language difficulties or, you know, other kind of psychosocial issues. So um, that would be, I think, the first thing we would do to try to um, prepare students in the best way possible, um, you know, for their studies. Um, without saying no, if that makes sense, because that's kind yeah. of contrary to what we would want to do. Yeah, okay, thanks Thanks for explaining that. Um, and related, um, how did students become aware of the scholarship? It's like um, a combination. So a lot of it's word of mouth. So I would say, oh, I could be a bit out of touch, but I feel like word of mouth is kind of our biggest um, you know, way that people come in. So, you know, we'll have a student who will then tell their friends and, you know, who will tell their friends. Um, yeah, we've had, we've had whole families, actually. We've had in the past husband, wife yeah. and daughter um, come to us over the years. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely, I think, personal referrals mm -hmm. and word of mouth. Um, but we also, um, we have our kind of key referral or, like, outreach agencies, I suppose. So, um obviously all the migrant resource centres, the asylum seeker resource centres. Um, one of our students this year, Samia, who's, who made that beautiful gold robe, um, is from the River Nile School. So the River Nile School is a school for, you know, um, young women from refugee backgrounds and we're in contact with them a lot about um, 
future students they might have as well as um, we're working on now that we're based at Collingwood Yards building out um, connections with the, the, the schools nearby as well as um, uh, the housing estates nearby as well because we're directly across the road from the Collingwood estate. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thanks for that. And um, so when the participants have finished the two-year program, um, are there any particular employment opportunities that you sort of have in mind for them? Could you give us a bit of an overview of what they're likely to do afterwards? Yeah, so um, we have um, both relationships and formal MOUs with a few different um, key, I guess, design or garment makers. So uh, we have an MOU with Kukai um, for an internship opportunity for a student to work within their design room. That wasn't able to happen this year because of... Um, obviously COVID, <laughs> COVID is like so much else, um, but one of our students who, past alumni students who has done that, has since gone, come back to um, intern with us and tomorrow starts with us as a casual as well. So that's a really nice story for us because she, um, you know, she graduated from us at 2019, but um, we've always seen, maintained contact and kept track of her progress and, um, you know, seen her development, which has been really amazing and, and um, now I want to give her that opportunity to work with us formally. Um, we also uh, have had a number of students go to Nobody Denim in Thornbury uh, over the years and some are still there. So the last time I was there, which was in July or May, um, actually, um, there were staff members there who'd been there since, who'd graduated Social Studio in 2012, which is a really nice story as well. So they had, um, you know, left as their first job and they were still within Nobody Denim and nobody is uh, one of those great employers that um, really wants a diverse workforce and, in fact, actively seeks out um, staff from refugee backgrounds and so are really key to give people the opportunity. Um, so I talked with John um, Cordelius and nobody a bit about how we integrate what we do as a kind of training provider and how, what, what he needs as an employer. And we try to kind of um, bridge this sort of skills gap that happens when, you know, a, a certificate delivers a certain level of, of skills, but an employer needs specific other things. So we, we try to kind of give um, our students more opportunity in things like um, illustrator or digital skills that will help translate into um, a real life work experience. Um, and then we also have our own um, paid internship program um, that we just launched this year. Um, but have not yet been able to <laughs> hire from. <laughs> um, oh but that will that will be coming. So that will hopefully be our first group hires will be in January. Um, and again, I guess what I'm talking about are all of the pathways into the garment industry. But actually, a lot of our students um, have gone on to, like Kate mentioned, work or rather further study. So we've had students go on to study. Um, associate degrees in fashion, um, cert fours, or, um, you know, bachelors. Some have um, kind of used the social studio not as much for a place where they want to go into fashion and design, but a place where they can kind of build confidence and capability. And so they've gone on to study, um, you know, I mean, Ali's a good, great example. He just won refugee, Young Refugee of the Year in the Victorian Multicultural Awards. Um, he's studying a master's in international studies and, you know, has been working as a community development worker. He's a, a, from an Afghan background, so he works with his community. So, um, Alec. Oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> Alec, um, one of our board members. Um, she started with us as a high school student doing her VCAL and then went on to do the cert, I'm pretty sure, um, and now works at NAB in finance. Um, so um, those aren't pathways or trajectories that we can necessarily have predicted, but I think it goes back to what Kate says about the work that Tiga does about goal setting at the very beginning. So, um, you know, if our students don't want to go into to fashion and design, that's fine, but what is it that they would really like to do and how can we help them get there? Um, and, you know, we build up as many kind of design and clothing-based opportunities as we can, but, the, you know, the reality is that sometimes just people 
are interested in so much stuff and this is one of the many things that they're interested in and we try to kind of facilitate them to to decide what direction they want to take um, beyond the social studio. Oh, that's wonderful. Transferable skills are so important. Um, well, that's it for all of the questions, although we do have one request. Could you quickly video around the retail shop um, so we can have a quick look at it, but just, just like a, a minute or so. Is that okay? Yeah, we love our store. <laughs> Do, do, do. do you want to like talk oh, through some of it? Yeah. This brand called Ulo, um, Dinzi actually has previously hired one of our students. Um, she's an amazing businesswoman. She's based at Abbotsford Convent, works with wax, cotton fabrics. She actually makes women's clothes. Um, so get on that if you can. We've got our <laughs> kids stuff. Um, we've got um, Indigenous brands, T-shirt brands, Banana Lands and Gavin Friends. Um, clothes from one of our dressmakers, T, who has started her own label called Tea the Label. Um, these are clothes from a local designer and uh, maker. Um, her brand is called Remuse. Um, Tamara makes them in Collingwood. She uses all natural dyes as well as um, organic cottons and that she's one of my favorite brands ever. Um, <laughs> just super thoughtful and philosophical. Um, we've got some of the work here, sorry, I just don't like that. Um, from our previous collaborations. This is a jumpsuit that we made with Ken Doan and um, local label Kauai. Um, this is uh, some pieces, a capsule collection we did with the local label Baal. Um, these are pieces from a uh, Kashmiri uh, designer and artist who's based out of Canberra. Um, named Badam, and I love her work as well. Um, we've got pieces from um, North in the Northern Territory. Um, we work with Indigenous art centres and uh, artists individually. Um, they've only got one collection left, and they're, they're sadly um, closing up, and they have a massive following. So um, those are the last pieces that you'll get from them. We've got new ceramics from a maker in uh, Brisbane. We've got um, these beautiful jewellery items from um, a young Japanese um, artist based in Melbourne um, named Yuria Okamura. These prints are from Olana Janfa, who's um, an Ethiopian artist who moved to Melbourne via Norway um, and is now working out of his studio in Northcote and he's a huge supporter of ours. Um, this is one of our favorite recent projects. Um, it's a collaboration with Atonga Tem, um, who's a South Sudanese artist. Romance was born, the Sydney brand and us. So Atong gave us her artwork. Romance gave us their silhouettes. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much for That's okay. uh, showing no us those. Maybe show the end so you can see the end. Yeah. Do. Just all this? Yeah. Yeah, cool. My phone's about to die anyway. <laughs> oh, wow, so many beautiful things. Yeah, and there's more to come, but no pressure. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have to wrap it up there, but thank you so much. Um, that was really, really Thanks. informative. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go, I'd just like to remind the members that um, the Melbourne Women's Fund Information Night video, which has information about the social studio and the other 2021 finalists, is now available on our website. And due to continuing uncertainty around how we will all transition from lockdown, the Grant Awards celebration will now be fully virtual to be held on Thursday the 18th of November, so please save the date. And finally, our sincere gratitude to the social studio and all our finalists and to our members. Without our memberships, our grants would not be possible. Thank you uh, again. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you at the Grant Awards on 18th November. Thanks, Davey and Kate.